Thank you, <clears throat> Brother Brandon. <clears throat> Be looking at Luke chapter 9, the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> Well, they call it senior moments, but I was trying to think while I was speaking of the songwriter, well, we sang her song tonight, Annie Johnson Flint. And uh, <clears throat> if I recall, and I may not, but I think she had one sister, just the two of them. And uh, when they were young, their parents both died. And family by the name of Flint took them in and I think adopted them. And then uh, I don't remember what happened to her sister. Do you, honey, remember what happened to her sister? But anyway, Annie had this, uh, wasn't it rheumatoid arthritis? Something like that and it just got worse and worse to where she was like I described this morning, but wrote that song, My Grace, his grace, or my grace is sufficient, and other uh, poems and songs. And we've had people that have gone through some very deep waters that have kept sweet and left us something that'll help us. Uh, you know, holiness is beautiful and it works. I uh, was calling was in my second pastorate. It was clear back in the late 60s. And I was calling in a nursing home. And I called on one lady. And when I left her room, I felt like I needed a spiritual shower bath. Uh, just so critical and bitter and she told me that she blamed her pastor that here she was in her 70s and was not established. And she said, my pastor came to call on me when I was a young woman in my 30s, told me that he believed that I needed to be sanctified. And I didn't, uh, I didn't blow up and get mad and so he accepted that I was sanctified, and she's blaming him now because he didn't press her harder that, to get sanctified. Forty years later now, she's still blaming him. And uh, I didn't comment. There's times, what good does it do? But I thought, well, sister, I've been in that pastor's place more than once where I've approached people about their need, and they deflected me. And I knew I'd gone as far as I could go, but it didn't change my opinion of their spiritual need. And that's probably what happened. Well, I left that room. It was a large nursing home, and it was quite a walk to the next call I was going to make. And I walked into that room where Grandma Brooks, I, I still remember the name of the other lady, but I won't tell you. <laughs> but I walked into Grandma Brooks' room she had fallen and broken her hip and had now been in that bed for, I think, six months. Had worn the hair off the back of her head, emaciated. And I walked into that room and she saw me and I said, hi, Grandma Brooks, how are you doing? And that bony hand, as skinny as she was to start with, even on her bony arm, the flesh hung down a little bit and she couldn't just get it up and it came up off the bed like this. <laughs> and when I walked up to her bed, she said, praise the Lord. <laughs> well, holiness works. <laughs> and Grandma Brooks, she was an old free Methodist. There was something, you know, just about every denomination has their personality. And those old free Methodists, there, there was a godliness about them, just a deep spirituality. And uh, some of their terms, I just loved them. I remember one of them was, a, uh, well, actually a Bible teacher I had. <clears throat> she was an elder and a preacher, never had married, 
but what a saint of God. I remember hearing her preach one time and she got so blessed with jumping so high and she was getting up in years when I heard that. But uh, I can still hear her saying the stately steppings of the Holy Ghost <laughs> and with such a reverence in her tone and, and a number of other statements. But we all have our personality, but uh, our denominations, in my opinion at least. And, uh, <clears throat> but the main thing is a personal relationship with God ourselves, to know that our sins are forgiven and our hearts been made clean by the mighty baptism with the Holy Ghost, his sanctifying power. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for them, for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did or Elijah? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy the men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now that, that just sounds heartless, but it's not. You need to understand the Jewish customs, and it would have been a great ordeal to go through days and so on. So uh, <clears throat> Jesus was not being heartless, and that's another study, but just that mention of that. 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at, my, at home at my house. But Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now you would think verse 62 would be the text, and I have used that and preached on these different ones that uh, did not follow Jesus. But my text is verse 51. The last part of it, these words. Would you please stand if, if you're able, if you're like me, that's a, getting to be a job. <laughs> okay, the last part and then we'll pray, but in honor to God's word. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful group of people. And I pray the blessing of God upon them. And now, Lord, would you speak through me to them thy word, glorify thyself, and may our eyes be lifted up to see Jesus tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. My subject is Christ's collision course. By the way, the rapture could take place at any time. Are you aware of the fact, and I know I've heard conspiracy theories and all kinds of uh, oh, just sensational claims, and maybe you remember in 1988, a man from Arkansas, sadly, wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Return. 
in 1988. And uh, it actually made me disgusted. Uh, there was a couple that my wife and I knew very well. Actually, my wife had sung in a trio with the lady. And they walked away from God when she left Bible college and she married this man. He was raised in a holiness preacher's home, but they just went the way of the world. Well, they read that book, put it in quotes, they got saved. And they were living where I was pastoring in the metro area. And I heard about it. I went to call them, found where they lived. I didn't even know for a while they were anywhere around. And they started attending my church. And the deadline, the date passed. And they got unsaved all of a sudden. <laughs> How many did that? I don't know. I finally got so tired of that, I paid my respects to that nonsense. Because the Bible says no man knows the date. In fact, there are no signs of the rapture. The signs are of the second coming. And the signs are for the Jew and for the tribulation. The rapture, then the seven years tribulation, then the revelation. In the rapture, Christ's feet do not touch the earth. We meet him in the air. And then afterwards. But I will have to say things are shaping up to where it looks to me like, and I don't make any dates, that is wrong, it's unscriptural to set dates, but it looks to me like it could happen at any time. Uh, Ukraine and Russia, it looks like uh, God's gonna put hooks in Russia's jaws and pull her down, and there's Syria, and uh, they'll unite together, there's Turkey, and all of that's listed in Ezekiel 38. And God's going to fight for Israel. She'll be cut off and stand alone because and I've felt for years that the United States, now President Trump did something that no other president had ever done, and he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Presidents prior to him had promised to do that. None of one of them had the courage. Now we have an anti-Israel leadership in our country. So if this happens soon, Ezekiel 38 battle, I think the biggest thing we're going to do is send an objection in, a very mild one, to the United Nations and say, you really shouldn't do that. But we won't defend Israel. Just my opinion, sir. But what I was going to tell you, that uh, I read something that it looks like, and it's already been signed, that probably within a year, will be in a cashless society and uh, to buy or not to buy or to sell is going to be controlled by the powers that be. I think we'll be out of here by that time. Now I've given you my opinion. You need to, to live and work to reach souls, but be expecting the Lord to come at any time. And uh, he, his, the rapture is imminent. That means it could happen right now, or it could be 50 years, but it's imminent. It's, it's hanging over us is what that is. But I'm not going to preach in a second coming tonight. That thought came to me, and I thought I'd just share that with you. When you see these things come to pass, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Praise God. Well, here's Jesus now coming into the final hours of his earthly ministry. So these words, he set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem. These words carry great import because when he set his face toward Jerusalem, it put him on a collision course. A course he could not avoid if he was going to fulfill the will of his father. So there are three things I'm going to leave with you tonight. What, the first one is what he came to when he came to Jerusalem. The second is what he came through when he went to Jerusalem. And the final, what did he come for? And uh, that's not perfect grammar because you're not supposed to end a sentence with a preposition. But we all do it. At least I think you all do it. I do. I try not to, but sometimes I do. But the first one, what he came to. 
He came to hostility. He was, Luke 13, 34 shows us that he was well aware of what awaited him. It said he suffered many things. Jerusalem was the place that had killed the prophets. And his suffering had to do with the elders who were the civil authorities. He didn't expect a pat on the back when he got there. His message was cross grain with what they believed. But he said, I'm going. It's kind of like Martin Luther when they warned him of, uh, of King George being at Worms. And, and of course, the Catholic hierarchy was out to kill him. And, and uh, <clears throat> Martin Luther, the monk that got saved and began to write and speak against the abuses of Roman Catholicism. And so his friends warned him not to go to Worms because of Duke George. He said, I'm going to Worms. If it's raining Duke George's on all the tiles of all the roofs in England, his, his backbone, that German. And I've got a little German in me. My mother was German. And uh, anyway, I could say some things about, about Germans, but one of the things about them, you, you speak of a Scottish person, you think of somebody that's tight. It's like, uh, like they told the story of the, uh, the Englishman that sat down and, to a cup of tea and a fly landed in his tea and he dumped it out. And uh, then a, a Spanish one, I think it was, that sat down to his tea and, and uh, he got a spoon and dipped the fly out. The Scottish fellow sat down to his cup of tea and a fly got in his tea and he grabbed it by the wings and picked it up and said, spit it out. So, you know, there's the, there's the differences. But Germans are known for their stubbornness and their backbone and and uh, anyway, Martin Luther, he had that. They had him before the tribunal, and they commanded that all of his works be burned. So they built a big bonfire in the city square, and people were throwing books into that. And they wanted him to recant. Luther said, okay, I recant. I formerly said the pope was the vicar of Christ. I recant. He is antichrist and of the devil. <laughs> I mean, you talk about bold. But then the books that were thrown into the fire, they found out that it wasn't the works of Martin Luther, it was the edicts of the Pope. And so the people were standing with Luther. But anyway, here's Jesus coming, and he said, I am going, knowing what he was facing. His face was set in the elders, the civil authorities were against him. And we're seeing now, What's happening in our land, the lady in Kentucky that refused as the county clerk to perform that marriage ceremony for the two sodomites, that's years ago. They're still after her. She's facing appeals now today. And uh, in a day when, when uh, there was a day we know when our country was favorable, in fact, was founded on Christian principles. Daniel Webster, that famous statesman, is the one that made not the dictionary, man, that's Noah Webster, but Daniel Webster, the statesman, said, the greatest thought that I could ever have is my accountability to God. Abraham Lincoln, whom they said was an infidel or an agnostic, and he may have been at one time, but something happened to that man, and during the Civil War, when he was the president, he spent 4 to 5 a.m. every morning on his knees before God. And he said, I went to my knees because there was no other place to go. And we could go on and on about the founding of our country. By the way, our, even Ronald Reagan, uh, I discovered that he had kept a journal, a daily diary for the eight years that he was in the White House. And I bought it. And it's over 700 pages. And I've read it front to back. And you talk about interesting, but what really got a hold of my attention was, was when his father-in-law, Nancy's father, a psychiatrist, a Dr. Davis, when he was very ill and approaching death, President Reagan was away from home and he wrote in his journal, I, I want Dr. Davis, I want to be able to get home to talk to Dr. Davis about his soul. 
he's, he's nearing the end and I'm not sure he's ready to go. Well, a lot of people didn't know that about President Reagan. He didn't have our light, obviously. But thank God for people that take stands that are favorable to God and, and Christianity and our flag and so on. But not only the elders, the chief priests, they were the religious uh, leaders. And so you had the civil authorities and you had the religious rulers that were against Jesus. Some of the most severe suffering that Jesus faced and that Christians face even today is at the hands of religious leaders. And uh, I once pastored seven preachers at the same time. <laughs> I was just a young man. But thank God these are holiness men, so they weren't troublemakers. But uh, Beverly Carradine went to St. Louis, Missouri to pastor a Methodist church. It was First Methodist Church, and it was the smallest and the weakest financially in the area there, and I think that around six. Of course, this was in the 1800s, and so St. Louis wouldn't have been as large as it is today. Actually, it it's shrank in population about 100,000 or more, no more than that. It was over 700,000 at one point. It's under 400,000 today. But uh, anyway, I went into Centenary Methodist Church where Caradine also pastored after he pastored First Church. But he went to First Church and he had a Holy Ghost revival and his church grew to be the largest in the area and the strongest financially. And, uh, and he started missions out of that church. And then he went to Centenary and uh, that has to do with century, and it, there's two correct pronunciations. It, it, you can pronounce it centenary or, or uh, uh, centenary, however I pronounced it the first time. Anyway, uh, I walked in, and, and to that church, I just, I, I love church history, history in general, but especially church history, and, and there was an uh, assistant pastor there. The pastor wasn't there. And the assistant, I couldn't tell her whether he was good looking or not. He had his uh, face all covered with brush. It's interesting, the first thing Joseph did when he got out of prison was shave before he went to see the, the Pharaoh. But anyway, I asked that man if he had any records there, Beverly Caradine. And he didn't know who Caradine was. But he went and got a book that had just been published on the history of that church, and he brought it to me. And I think the Lord helped me find it. I turned to that page almost immediately where it said, In 1894, Beverly Caradine came to Centenary Methodist Church full of the doctrine of entire sanctification. And uh, his predecessor, John Matthews, and uh, he's in... Uh, in eternity. I don't know where he went. But anyway, he, he uh, was pastoring a church west of there now. And, uh, but he kept contact with the members and caused Caradine trouble because he was a holiness fighter. But in that Centenary Methodist Church, or Centenary, I've got them now, I've got those pronunciations right. I, I went in there in the sanctuary and I knelt at every chair on the platform because I wanted to get the one that cared I knelt at before he preached. And I knelt at about every spot at the altar because I wanted to kneel where those seven Methodist preachers that got sanctified in one, the same night under the preaching of Beverly Caradine, where they knelt. But anyway, religious leaders many times are the ones that plant the questions concerning the veracity or the accuracy of the Word of God. I tell you, I heard Brother Dan Stetler preach at IHC Wednesday night, and did God ever help that man? You may not be aware of it, but even in the conservative wholeness movement, there's a questioning and an attacking of the King James Version. And uh, doc, doctor, he is a doctor, it's a DD, it's, so it's an honorary doctorate that Brother Stetler has, but anyway, he faced that head on and he said, any you young fellows trying to undermine this, I'll meet with any one of you at any time. I wrote my master's thesis on this and I'm equipped and I'm ready for you. And that's not a verbatim quote, but, but anyway, religious leaders are the ones that plant questions in the minds of people. Now don't think I'm against religious leaders, but I'm against the false ones. Martin Luther said, if the clergy could have destroyed the church, she would have been destroyed long ago. Well, of course, he was referring no doubt to the 
priests and the popes that he had to deal with and had to face and, and so on. But so Jesus suffered many things at the hands of the elders, the civil authorities, at the hands of the chief priests, the religious rulers, and also the scribes. They were the moral rulers or leaders. And yet each one of those were the ones that caused Jesus himself trouble. I remember going through a very severe trial at the hands of professed Christians and uh, feeling the pressure very greatly. And a dear friend of mine uh, was aware of it and contacted me just to give me, that's a wonderful thing to have somebody that finds out you're in the, in the pressure cooker and lets you know they're standing with you. But anyway, uh, he did that, but, uh, but during that time, I felt the presence of the Lord and I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said to me, they didn't do this to you. They did it to me. And uh, the Lord lifted me and helped me in that. Well, here Jesus suffered many things and the people were following their rulers. And I believe in that. I've always been cooperative. Uh, if, uh, if I was in a, any type of organization where there was a, a leader other than myself, I did everything I could to get behind him and boost him. But if it comes to an issue of right and wrong, then uh, we take our stand for right. Doesn't matter how many people are for it or against it. I, I am so thankful for my home, my mother and father. Uh, my mother, <laughs> was such a good mother. I've been thinking of it lately, just the things she sacrificed. And she was a mischief. She was a tease. And uh, if you're around her, you probably, well, she cooked for camps. And it was not unheard of for the evangelist to have thread wound through his pancakes. And uh, they always had the young people in the church over when I was a grade school boy, I loved it when my heroes, the teenagers, would come over. And I remember the, one of the preacher's boys one night had a glass of milk and he, he was drinking it and then he saw what was in it. He turned, of course, everybody's watching him. He turned absolutely white as a sheet as he put that milk down because he, he thought the rubber worm my mother put in there was real. And then there was Betty. Betty was sophisticated. I mean, everything had to be perfect. And she just, and so at her wedding, my mother got a hold of a fly, plastic fly that had a pin on it about that long and stuck that pin into the wedding cake. And so Betty sat there and noticed the fly and she'd look all around at the people that are at the reception to make sure nobody was looking, and nobody was, but everybody was. No sense having fun if you don't have people have fun with you, so my mother let everybody know. And finally, and Betty tried to shoo the fly away, and it wouldn't leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she looked this way and that and took daintily, tore a corner off the napkin, and very carefully checking to see if anybody was looking, reached out and with that piece of napkin took hold of the fly and pulled and pulled and pulled. And of course the crowd enjoyed it very much. But the one time my mother disappointed me, I can't believe it to this day. My dad went to heaven and my mother was a widow. And this old rich fellow got interested in her. And she told him to hit the road. I said, Mother, I cannot believe you. I said, here you are, an old woman. Won't be long and you'll be dead. But you wouldn't marry that fellow with all that money. You never thought about Avis, my sister, and me one second. All you thought of was yourself. And I had, that's not like you. All of our lives, you did things you sacrificed for us. 
And now it comes down to where we could have inherited all that money, and you. but no, think of us. Oh, no, just think of yourself. That's all you did. I, I, it was the most disappointed I've ever been in my mother. <laughs> well, she had it coming. She teased me, her boy, her precious boy. But, but anyway, people followed their rulers. And I followed my father and mother, and I had carnal rebellion in my heart and did not want to go the way they were teaching me and training me. But when I got saved, it didn't take me five years. That day, I began to live by the principles of my father and mother. My father, it didn't matter if it was an act of Congress. If it was wrong, he wouldn't do it. Uh, and I could tell you stories about that, but I forbear. But anyway, people were following their rulers. But where is the individual that is going to stand up for what's right? Amen. I, I remember working in a battery case factory when I was a student in Bible college. It was a union shop. I didn't like that, but I didn't have any choice. But I did have a choice when they had a wildcat strike walkout. And uh, one of the men had cussed out the foreman. And the foreman fired him. And <clears throat> when the foreman fired him, they had this wildcat, meaning they walked off the job immediately. The union steward came to me and said, are you going with us? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, because he needed to be fired. I will not participate in this. We stood toe to toe. He was so mad, I believe he could have chewed nails and spit at rust. I didn't know whether he was going to hit me or not. He was shaking he was so mad. I just stood and stared at him. Said, I told you I'm not going. Finally, he turned and walked away. I found out later, I didn't know this at the time, I thought I was the only one. I found out later there were some sinners that were principled enough they wouldn't participate. Thank God I didn't. What would my testimony been with those sinners that I was trying to witness to and win to the Lord? But if you take your stand on certain issues, people are going to say bad things about you. That's why some people don't take their stand. They're afraid what's going to be said about them. As Dr. David Gibbs said concerning that statement, always. <laughs> yes, they will. And if you've ever taken your stand, they're going to say bad things about you. I could give you more illustrations. No need for that. But he came to hostility when he set his face to Jerusalem. And he also came to a doomed city. Jesus knew Jerusalem was, was doomed. And this happened within a generation. How many remembered? How many in Jerusalem remembered when Jesus had warned when Rome besieged the city? There were three factions. One was eliminated. Two continued to fight for control while Titus made his attack on the city of Jerusalem. And uh, we stood up there at that great citadel in the mountains where the Jews, that remnant of the Jews, held off the Romans for a long, long time. But anyway, there were Jewish leaders that guarded the city walls to keep their people from fleeing to the Romans for safety. And Titus wanted to back off and give Jerusalem an opportunity to surrender. Now, Jesus knew all of that, but he went anyway. He also knew that this would be a rebuilt city, and it's not done yet. Revelation 21 talks about the new Jerusalem. I'll say this about Jerusalem. On Saturday night, we were in Hotel Dan, I think was the name of it, so Sunday, we had one meal provided for us by the tour group, but that was all. So as we don't buy, sell and buy on a Sunday, we wanted to go find some place where we could get a little food for our 
in our, to eat in our room on the Lord's Day. So about two blocks, I think, from the motel, we found a convenience store and bought our little n snacks for the next day. And as we were walking back to the hotel, I, I said to my wife, I said, honey, this is amazing. We are in a city of about 800,000 Christ-rejecting Jews and we're walking down this street in the middle of all of this, and I feel the presence of God. I'll tell you, God loves Jerusalem, and he's going to rebuild it. And Jesus, of course, knew that. So what he came to, let's look at what he came through. The attachment to comfort. There are some illustrations that I read to you, verses 57 and 58 of this. The one man said, follow me, and Jesus responded in essence saying, you better count the cost. And the attitude of detachment from all that prevents progress toward Jerusalem. That's the attitude Jesus had. And anybody that was going to follow him was going to have to have the same attitude, and it's true today. We must be detached from the things of this world. Well, uh, I like a nice car. I like a nice house. So do, so do you folks. But I'm detached. It belongs to God. And uh, it's his. It's not mine. I thank God for every comfort I have in this world. But my, my focus is on Jesus Christ, and I am following him. A man pastored me when I was a boy in fifth and sixth grade in grade school. He had a boy that was a year older than I, and, and we were, of course, great buddies. This pastor, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was one of the, had one of the greatest knowledges of the Bible of anybody I've ever known. And the reason I know that now is because, oh, about 20 years later, or a little more than that, uh, I became his pastor, and uh, I would, he, was, he had had seven heart attacks, and so he'd had to retire from the ministry, and he was still able to work some. He was 74, I think, when I became his pastor, or close to that, and uh, he was an electrician. He, he knew wiring, and he wired the church we, we bought and remodeled and, and uh, upgraded, and what, but tremendous Bible knowledge, but that man twice in his life sold every earthly possession he had to keep the doors of home mission church open. And he was so conscientious. He drove a Ford Econoline van and it wore out and, and he wanted another one. So he went shopping for one and he found one and he looked it over very carefully and then he said to the man selling it, I'm going to give you $200 more than you're asking for. You don't realize it, but that van is worth more than what you're asking me. And I'm going to be honest and fair to you and give you $200 more. Now, I have never done that, and I don't expect I will. <laughs> and I'm simply illustrating his commitment to God. He lived a life of sacrifice. And, and again, I, I would never take advantage of somebody, by the way, if I was buying something and, and I would tell them. I, uh, I had a John Deere tractor toy, and I did a lot of farm work with that when I was a little boy. Cast iron with the farmer molded into the, on the seat. He's a part of it. And... Uh, <clears throat> I gave it to my grandson, Britt. You all know Britt. And no, no, I didn't. I gave it to my nephew, Brian, my sister's boy. And a year or two passed or so on. He's a married man. We were out there in Idaho, and we were at the table together, and Brian said, Uncle Dale, you know that tractor you gave me? I said, yes. He said, I had it priced or, or valued. That's worth $400, and I don't feel right about keeping it. I'm giving it back to you. I said, no, you're not. I gave you that. That is yours. No, he said, I, I, we, we were, you know, an irresistible force had just run into an immovable object. 
Finally, he said, will you give it to Britt? I said, I'll do that. So Britt still has it, I think. <laughs> if his boys haven't torn it up. <laughs> but fairness, principle, commitment. Jesus said, follow me. And the man was too comfortable to follow Jesus. Well, so there has to be an attachment to comfort considered, and it must be the attitude of detachment. Now, also an abandonment of earthly ties. Jesus sounds cruel. I've mentioned that when I read through it, when he said, let the dead bury the dead. Sound like he didn't even care. Well, I mentioned to you that uh, there was quite a process to that. And I'll go ahead and tell you a little more about it. There's a man over there in the Middle East that hired an Arab sheik to guide him or tried to. He offered to pay him well. He said, no, I can't go. Well, why not? Because I have to bury my father. And there was his father sitting alive and well in the door of his tent, wide awake. He was somewhat aged, but he wasn't dead. Well, George Adam Smith, the man that told this story, said he was expressing devotion to his father. He was saying to me that I would like to be your guide, but this devotion exceeds the devotion I could give to you to be an adequate guide. So Jesus was saying, I have abandoned earthly tie that I might make my way to Jerusalem and fulfill the will of my father. And then in verse 59, he doubtless saw a peculiar quality that, that he needed, and he called out to the man, but the man's devotion to other relationships exceeded his devotion to Christ. His demand was to abandon the highest and dearest earthly tie that you might follow him, and that demand is still in force today. It doesn't mean we walk away from a family, but it means that we follow Jesus, whatever the family says. Or it could be like a missionary I heard speak. And uh, that was so oh, nearly 50 years ago. And the power of that message of this single lady who is home from New Guinea and how she stirred our hearts when she got through. It was at a preacher's meeting and the, the leader uh, of that district had given her a slot to speak to the preachers. We did have a special speaker that was preaching to the preachers, but she had a, a time slot that was given to her. And when she got through, every preacher in that sanctuary was in the altar, not to be saved or sanctified, but when your leader who is godly soul winner gets up when she gets done and says, I'm going to the altar and I want you all to gather and pray for me that I'll be a soul winner. Well, I was a young preacher there, and I went to the altar, but I didn't pray for him. I prayed for me. But, oh, how stirring that message was. But I remember she told this story. When God called her to New Guinea, she had siblings that were married. She had parents that were aged. And they put the pressure on her and called her awful and, and just demeaned her and said, it's your duty to take care of mom and dad. You're the only one that's not married. I don't know what difference that made. The parents were parents to all of them. To me, they all had equal obligation. But she said her family turned on her, but God had called me. And God used her in winning souls. They had a Holy Ghost revival during her term there. There was another single lady that uh, had a nervous breakdown, and they felt like... Part of it was because she had fasted so much for that revival. And actually, uh, she had come home. She, she lost her clear thinking. She was lost in the Los Angeles airport. And finally, her brother-in-law found her. And they got her home, and she was in the hospital and in the, in the mental ward of where I was pastoring. And I would go and see her every day. And uh, she thought she was lost, and, 
and so on. The devil is mean, but I want to tell you that missionary is going to have a reward in heaven. I probably won't even see her. Be like John Wesley when they asked him if he'd ever see George Whitfield in heaven. They were theological enemies. Whitfield went Calvinist, and Wesley, of course, Wesley and Armenian, and and so this person knew about their great difference and their divide and said, Mr. Wesley, you think you'll see Whitfield in heaven? He said, no, I don't believe I will because he'll be so much closer to the throne than I will be. What a spirit, what an attitude. But anyway, this, this missionary lady said, God had called me. My heart was torn, but I knew I had to mind God. Well, these are the things he went through when he came to Jerusalem and altering the course would, would have hindered his progress in fulfilling his father's will. So he came through hostility, doom and death and through all the travail that makes the kingdom sure. Thirdly, what did he come for? The devil came to destroy your life. Jesus came to save it. He came, verses 53 to 55, he came to destroy that Samaritan spirit. It said they did not receive him in verse 53, 54 and 55. James and John said, said let's, let's get rid of him. Let's, uh, no, Jesus came to destroy that spirit. It is possible to be zealous for the honor of God with a spirit that puts us out of harmony with God. Uh, I'll tell you this story. I use it in a sermon I preach sometimes first night of revivals or camps on brokenness. But I've been always been very conscious uh, financially and uh, have had to deal with people that were remiss in their duties. But <clears throat> The treasure I had when I went to pastor this church was a wonderful saint of God, but she wasn't the best bookkeeper. And I was helping her try to get things lined out and not realizing I, I, just my presence, I guess, and my insistence that everything be perfect was putting undue pressure on her. And uh, she was a farmer's wife, and I was out there farm and in the house there going over the books with her, and I, I noticed that some bills were past due. And I said, what's, what's the deal here? Why aren't these paid? And I'd already talked to her about it, maybe the month before. She said, well, the way we do our farm business, when we get a bill, I just put it here, and..." My bills build up, and at the end of the month, I, I pay them all. I said, well, you might do your business that way, but you're not going to do God's business that way. This is the name of the church in our community. And if that bill is due the 15th, you will pay it on or before the 15th. Do you understand me? And... Uh, Yes, <laughs> yes, I do, Brother Hayford. I was standing for right, the reputation of the church. We got into camp meeting not too long after that, and uh, a large crowd in that big camp tabernacle and altar service. I don't know if it's the first one or not, but a bunch of my people were in the altar and I headed down to pray for them and do my pastoral duty. Before I got there, the Lord spoke to me and said, don't you go down there and pray for those people. You go find your treasure and apologize to her. You were right, but your spirit was wrong. You were too hard. And the Lord was kind and gentle, but he was firm and I knew it was him. I went looking for her. You know what? She was looking for me. <laughs> and we met somewhere in that tabernacle, and I said, Sister, I don't apologize for insisting that our bills be paid on time, but I was too harsh. I, you, I owe you an apology, and I need your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Oh, no, Brother Hayford. I was the one that was wrong, and I need your forgiveness. But what I'm talking about you can stand for right, 
in a wrong spirit. Yeah. I didn't lose the blessing, but I would have had I not obeyed God. I didn't have a blow up. I was just standing firm. Well, some people, I'll show him. Oh, I forgot, I'm a Christian. You like bumper stickers? I like very few of them. I saw one I liked. It said, let your conscience be your guide, but conscience was crossed out. And above it in bold red was Bible. <laughs> let your Bible be your guide. Train your conscience according to the word of God. Now I like that one. Do you remember that one? I haven't seen it in years. It said honk if you know Jesus. And this person was at the stoplight with that bumper sticker and somebody behind honked and he reached out the window and shook his foot, fist at him. And they leaned out and said, pointed at the bumper sticker, I know Jesus. <laughs> well, they needed to be rebuked for that spirit. So he came, he came to destroy the Samaritan spirit and to impart a steadfast spirit. Don't you love Christian people that walk with God and you saw them 10 years ago and then you saw them again and they're still the same, still walking with God, still the same tender spirit, still the same separation from the world. Jesus came to depart, to impart a steadfast spirit. He came to implant a selfless spirit. He brought on the collision. He was on a collision course. And he brought it on himself. He could have hidden in the Galilean hills. Instead, his words became heavier and harder. Not in spirit was he harder, but his words were heavier and they were closer. As he said, searching things to bring his enemy out of their corners. His last loving wrestle between himself and the Pharisees comes to a bloody close. The collision had taken place. And after the collision, blood was running. And we hear the sarcasm thrown at him as he hung from the cross. Save thyself. But he chose not to. The Bible said he saved others himself. He could not save. No, he couldn't. Not and save you and me. He could have saved himself, but not if he was going to save you and me. Come down from the cross, cried the ribald crowd. Come down, cried the Pharisee. Still it isn't too late. You'll be famous and great. We'll all believe in thee. But the Son of God, bowed with shame and reproach, alone and in agony, refusing the offer of friend and of scoffer. He died there on Calvary. Come down from the cross, cries the world today. The challenge is still the same. That way is too narrow. There's too much sorrow. There's too much reproach and shame. Take the easier way. Take the popular way. Go along with the crowd, gay and free. There's nothing to gain in a way fraught with pain. You must leave out Calvary. Come down from the cross, the tempter suggests to gifted preachers today. There's no future for you if you stay with a few who walk in the narrow way. The way of suffering, denial, and death won't suit the masses. You'll see, if you hope to succeed, you must change that old creed. You must leave out Calvary. Come down from the cross. That never can be. Tis the only way for me. There is rapture complete. There is fellowship sweet. There is joy and there's victory. It's hard to explain how the joy comes with pain, how the cross makes glad and free. From self-crucifixion comes blessed resurrection. There's triumph at Calvary. I'm glad I've taken the way of the cross. Let's stand together, please.